welcome to the session food constituents the block 2 of the course this block consists of four units unit 3 is carbohydrate and lipids the unit 4 is proteins enzymes and water unit 5 is vitamins and minerals and unit 6 is food additives now the question comes in mind what is the importance of food constituents like if you recall dr siddu mentioned the food constituents gives us the nutritional profile and in preparation of balanced diet to give you an example if you have 10 rupees you have you want to spend for some your nutrition whether you want to take milk a glass of milk or you want to take a egg or you want to take a fruit juice now how do you decide this we know if you know the constituents of the milk if you know the constituents of the juice if you know the constituents of the egg then you will be able to decide properly that what is required for you or for your mother or for young children and what is required for the balanced food so the knowledge of food constituents gives helps us in giving the nutritional status of the food and in preparation of the balanced diet the other importance of food constituents is because constituents undergo changes the carbohydrate goes into simpler form proteins also changes into simpler form so during the post harvest handling during the processing and during the storage these constituents undergo changes so we should know what type of changes they take place there could be some good changes there could be some bad changes also now this course this program where we are going for preservation and preparation of value added products naturally processing is an integrated part of the things now for there should be proper selection of the temperature and combination to give you an example if you take milk and you boil it the vitamin c losses will take place so up to what composition up to what temperature and time combination you should heat it that vitamin losses are minimum similarly these processing parameters help so for selection of the processing parameter we need to know the constituents so for nutritional point of view for functional properties for food safety and for legal requirement we want to know the processing parameter then the food constituents knowledge is must and as the food additives also it is used now this is the importance of the food constituents that's why their knowledge is must so we say the food constituent is for the nutrition purposes for understanding the changes which are taking place in the the constituent during processing and storage and particularly for selection of processing parameters i give you example from nutritional angle of point similarly for functional properties also and for safety point of safety is very important like you see the milk which is available into the market is pasteurized milk what does pasteurized milk does is that it makes sure that all pathogenics are not present in the milk so food safety is there then the legal requirements are also there if you see the you are taking the type of food fruit and which any product is there there are certain legal requirements are there that this should contain minimum of this much of fat percentage this much of sugar percentage if you are going to launch as an entrepreneur a new product you must know that what is legal requirement whether you have to add up more sugar or you have to add up more juice into the this product so these the knowledge of food constituents helps us in deciding these factors now the constituents we know so we'll take one by one the constituent the major constituent is the carbohydrate is there now what is the carbohydrate as a chemically we say it consists of carbon hydrogen and oxygen and it is the ratio of the hydrogen and oxygen is same as in the water to give you an example simple example is glucose the other examples are particularly in cereals starches are there the cane sugar the milk sugar all these examples are of the carbohydrates are there then cellulose of wood and paper is also an example of carbohydrate oil. technically they are known as polyhydroxy aldehyde aldehydes are ketones they are the two groups they could be aldehydes or they could be ketones like glucose is an example of polyhydroxy aldehydes 
and the fructose is an example of ketone is there and in simple terms these are also known as saccharides and we use the word osc suffix that is fructose the fruit sugar is normally known as fruct fructose milk sugar is known as lactose and the malt sugar is known as the maltose is there so and the chemically you should know cn h2on is chemically we represent this so this is about the carbohydrates is there now they are further divided into three groups monosaccharides oligosaccharides and polysaccharides now first thing is what is monosaccharides monosaccharides means simple sugars and in very that the carbon numbers will be between 2 to 10 molecules is the number is there particularly in reference to our fruit and vegetable course or in food the normally the carbon molecules are from 3 to 10 are and more particularly pentose and hexose is, that is carbon molecules is 5 or 6 is the major number is there now the common example of i mentioned there are polyhydroxy aldoses and ketoses aldose examples are glucose mannanose and galactose and ketose examples are fructose and sorbose they are neutral they are crystallizable substances readily soluble in water and sweet and one of the other property which they show is they are able to rotate the plane of the polarized light and they could be either rotated on a right side or left side so we write the word dextro rotatory or levo rotatory is there so the glucose is a we write as a dextro and fructose is a levo or left rotate it towards the plane of light and we represent it by minus is the there so this is the monosaccharides are simple sugars are there one of the example then we come to the oligosaccharides it is a combination of 2 to 10 monosaccharides per molecule of the things so when 2 to 10 monosaccharides are present they are known as the oligosaccharides are there so when they they combine together they release the water molecule and they give the uh, examples of disaccharides are milk lactose you must have heard many people say i cannot take milk i am having lactose intolerance that they are not able to so this lactose is a example of disaccharides it made of two glucose one is two monosaccharides glucose and galactose makes the lactose similarly sucrose is a glucose and fructose and maltose is an example of two molecules of glucose is there and raffinose which is present in the sugar beet is an example of trisaccharides it is a polymer of glucose fructose and galactose is there so this group is known as oligosaccharides is there now particularly the sweetness level is important in these type of oligosaccharides i mentioned in fruit and vegetables which is for our concern in this course mainly monosaccharides and disaccharides are present so what is the sweetness level is there for our comparative purpose the sugar sweetness we have kept as 100 and then we have given a table fructose is 173 or one is there glucose is 74 corn syrup is 30 honey is 97 you you are aware that in market some uh, the artificial sweeteners are available known as saccharine so its sweetness is very high so these are the uh, sweetness of the thing sweetness of the different type of the sweetness is there then we come to the polysaccharides polysaccharides are the polymers of the simple monosaccharides that is many molecules of the monosaccharides are there of mannose hexose or pentose and the, their characteristics are they are not sweet and they are not insoluble in water and the example of polysaccharides are starch and pectin are good example now what is the starch is there starch it consists of amylose and amylopectin is there now amylose is a straight chain molecules and whereas amylopectin is a branched molecule is there it is insoluble in cold water now the important thing is starch it has a it starts swelling at its gelatinization temperature once you start heating the starch molecule start in the any starch it becomes in water it becomes viscous on cooling it may form a gel and when you keep 
cool it also there is a property known as retrogradation where there is a formation of precipitation is there to give you a common example the bread will be more have more shelf life in the room temperature as compared to the in the fridge normally it is advised that we should not keep the bread into the fridge because there the chances of this property retrogradation of the starch take place on cooling and its spoilage could be more so we, it is always recommended that keep in the outside and it will be safe for the four or five days now these are the properties now when we develop a new product so we should know about the constituents role of the starch and this that then starch provides many functional properties for the food applications is there so this is the stuff then the important group within the polysaccharides is pectin it is galactouronic acid now the it undergoes the changes during the ripening and that's why it becomes the more uh, the changes in ripening are the fruit the change in the texture the change in the uh, the taste is because of the this what we call we say softening of fruit is taking place because of the breakdown of the pectin is taking place now this also plays an important role in gelling when we manufacture jam jelly and marmalade the composition of pectin plays an important role if you are preparing a fruit jam and in natural sources pectin is not coming or if you are trying a new fruit for preparation of jam the jam will not get a structure so the pectin presence of pectin is must for this purpose is there now for a good jelly there should be good composition of the sugar content ph and the the amount of the pectin is also required what are the sources apple lemon and citrus fruits are good sources that's why whenever the jam are prepared apple or papaya or these type of the things which are the good source of the pectin should be always added so this is about the importance of the pectin is there then the other example of the polysaccharides is the gum gum is they are the also a polysaccharides now gums can be also available from the microbial sources also now there are two types of plant gums and microbial gums examples we have given guar gum locust bean gums gum arabica and alginates are the example of the plant sources where the dextrin and xanthin gums are the source of the microbial so now these things because they give the polysaccharides are these gives the functional properties like dr sindhu was giving an example of ice cream for giving the good when we it contains water so that the ice crystals doesn't form big we want to have we want to add up some stabilizers or gums this is an example of alginates or sodium alginates are added so that the water molecules will not grow big or they will not flow so these are the purpose of the using gum and of the the things is there then we come to the another important source and the constituent is the lipid is there the carbohydrate is also important for the giving the caloric fit value and lipids because it gives the higher amount 9 kilo calories of energy we get from the lipids is, is there now their characteristics are they are organic substances they are insoluble in water but are they are soluble in organic solvents like ether and benzene they we classify into main three groups fat and oils is one group then waxes and phospholipids are is there but all they contain the fatty acid so the important is fatty acids now the fatty acids are two types saturated and unsaturated fatty acids are there and example of saturated is palmitic acid lauric acid and stearic acid and unsaturated fatty acids are oleic acid and linoleic acid unsaturated mean they contain the double bond double bond mean the carbon molecules are not completely uh, the settled are not the uh, balanced and they could be could be reason for going for oxidation is there so if the more number of unsaturated fatty acids are present there the food can go more is the oxidation but nutritionally some of these unsaturated fatty acid like linoleic acid and linoleic acid are required for the our body purposes are also there so we have to make a balance we when we see the balanced diet that we should contain a good um, a minimum amount of fatty acid which is required by our body but if any oil which contains more number of 
unsaturated fatty acids then its shelf life will be very low is there right then what are the properties for characterization of the fat and lipids the important point is melting point refractive index smoke point flash point and fire point <coughs> these property helps us in characterization of the fat like this the fat from the milk the fat from the sunflower or, or fat from the coconut or the fat from the groundnut or mustard it will be varying from the these things are there then there are certain uh, we call them the well like richard missile value saponification value iodine number iodine number gives us number of unsaturated fatty acids are there richard missile values helps us in giving the number of volatile fatty acids are present is there so as i mentioned unsaturated fatty acids are responsible for density development and we have to add antioxidants for their prevention but certain unsaturated fatty acids are required for by by our body purpose they are type of essential fatty acids so the food must be present the food must be provided by these unsaturated fatty acids then come the other sources the other important constituents is the protein the importance to the protein we say it is the the top position is given to the protein only when we say the food because it constitutes the main structure of our body or even the animal body so the any food when we judge them we say that how much protein it is going to provide is the importance the protein importance is also because the growth and development of body and its complete formation depends upon the uh, proteins only the other examples the other importance is they also provides enzymes and hormones which are required for the functioning of our body systems like we said in the fruit and vegetables we said food physiology is there from human physiology also there are many reaction the like uh, processes which takes place like digestion of the system the respiration and other uh, physiological changes are processes takes place simultaneously for those we need enzymes and hormones so proteins are also sources of these enzymes and hormones also now what does proteins con con constituents the amino acids are the building blocks of proteins like we said in the carbohydrates we have the the glucose the sucrose glucose is the main uh, constituent then we fatty acids in for the lipids for proteins we call them the amino acids are the building blocks of it now proteins contains amino group and it will also contain the carboxyl group and the bond which forms is known as the peptide bond is there we classify the proteins into three groups one is known first is simple proteins what does simple proteins mean once you will hydrolyze them they will yield the amino acids only like to give you an example albumin and globulin these are the example of simple proteins then we come to the conjugated proteins conjugated proteins in this amino acid is present then some non protein material is present like lipids nucleic acid and carbohydrate like phosphoproteins lipoproteins these are known as the conjugated proteins are there and derived proteins are the they are obtained by chemical or enzymatic method by by some process in the sense they are basically protein is got changed due to some chemical or enzymatic method like protein hydrolases are the examples of derived proteins are there so this is how we classify the important change which takes place in the protein is the denaturation of the protein is there what is denaturation is a it, it is a type of uncoiling the proteins are present in a coiled structure so uncoiling takes place there is a there is no breakage of the covalent bonds but there is a change in structure is there to give you an example is when you take egg and you boil it when you boil it becomes hard so there is a what does it has happened there is a denaturation of protein has taken place right there is no so this is an example of denaturation of pro protein is there the other example you take from the milk now when we take the milk contains as you know the casein and the whey proteins are the major component when you take example i am giving of the paneer if you take milk and you make a paneer from without heating it right what will happen is it will the paneer will contain less of the whey proteins but when you heat the milk 
the whey proteins get denatured they also get associated with the casein component so this type of protein will con uh, the uh, paneer will contain more of the whey proteins also so these are the examples of denaturation so this denaturation depends depends upon the heat ph salt and these things are there there is a some loss of biological activity and there is some change in the physical properties also in the denaturation process so when we take the protein right so there is a going to be denaturation so as and food scientists or technologists we have to make sure that there is a minimum of denaturation is there we mentioned in the fat and lipids there should be minimum of rancidity is there but when you see the processing there should be minimum of denaturation of the processing is there along with this is there is a, a known as protein is known as the non enzymatic browning which is also known as millard browning is there it is actually reaction between the amino acids and the hydroxyl groups of the sugar the non enzymatic browning can be desirable also or it could be undesirable also the brown crust formed on the bread or cake is a type of desirable browning is there but if you take in the sterilized milk or those things it is a undesirable browning is there so protein the one i give example it has a tendency to get denatured the other characteristics which is that it can go for the millard browning also is there so how to control this you can control this by reducing the reaction rate if the things i mean if the amino group and hydroxyl group don't come together or somehow the rate of reaction can slow down the browning can be slowed down when we are discussing amino acid a term is known as essential amino acids which we, we must know because if you are going to develop now and the trend is to develop health foods or healthy foods so then we have to develop the we may add, like to add up some amino acid as nutritional foods so these are the essential amino acid which cannot be synthesized in body it has to be provided into the food these are the nine amino acids are there which are the essential amino acids which are present in there the proteins then the next is the enzymes which are present into there they are called the biocatalyst in the sense they are present in all the biological system and they will act on a substrate and produce the some uh, some substance which will be good or which could be bad enzyme it is used for the in the beverages for fermentation this amylase enzyme is used is there so the enzymes are basically proteins in nature and all the the curd yogurt it is basically based on the microbial the action of the microbial and particularly their enzymes that we get the simpler compounds are there these enzymes are specific to the particular substrate is there and high degree of specificity is there and now the trend is to go for immobilized enzyme that the enzymes they are uh, spotted onto the water insoluble spot and so that the activity is prolonged and is for longer period is there the other important constituent is the water now water plays an important role in the food spoilage is there the term which we use is the water activity now it, what is water activity it is the ratio of moisture content of the product and the relative humidity of the air surrounding it so in a simple terms if you are low at the dry products have a low water activity and all those product which uh, which are the shelf life very poor they have the high water activity particularly our fruit jellies our syrups and these they, they are known as intermediate moisture foods the moisture is in range of 20 to 40% and the water activity is above 5 is there so if you want to have the the longer shelf life product so the water activity should be as minimum as possible now water quality plays very important role because water is an ingredient which is used as a raw material it is also used for processing for generating steam for cleaning raw material for cleaning plant and equipment if you could recall recently there has been controversy about the the cold drink cola drinks it has been the cola drink people's manufacturer says it is because of the water quality and not of our combination or the product uh, manufacturing problem so water plays as a fruit and food and fruit and vegetable entrepreneur you just see that water quality which you are using is also important we should use the potable water 
what was the portable mean <coughs> it should contain no bacteria it should not be they should be clear it should be colorless it should be free from the odor and um, bad uh, taste material is there the very important thing we we have been knowing this this the hardness of water is there the hardness of water is basically because of the the salts of the calcium and magnesium and if it is collides and surface they give permanent hardness and temporary hardness is due to the bicarbonates and we express the hardness in terms of the parts per million of calcium carbonate which is present into there and this is the the classification which is there if the the carbonate calcium carbonate is less than 50 it is known as soft water if the ppm of calcium carbonate is above 200 it is very hard so for your the plant or for these things the soft uh, the calcium carbonate compound content should be less this was about the chemical they would say the hardness is there and i mentioned we you should be potable water there is another aspect is the microbiological is there we must ensure that the coliform are not present into the water and if you have the water from the deep well source it there is a less chance of showing the coliform is there so the microbiological quality also should be tested and how do we test the these are the characteristics physical characteristics mean you just check the color order taste and turbidity for chemical characteristics see the total solids organic matter these are the component alkalinity ph and for microbiological examination plate count so when you are going to set up a new factory or place of location you must see the water quality in that area because it is going to have an important impact on your product uh, the other important constituents is the vitamins this is particularly important for fruit and vegetables because when we say fruit and vegetables are called productive foods it is because of the vitamins and minerals and particularly for our course food, this minerals and vitamins are more important then sugars are more important because the lipids are very less present into the fruits and vegetables are there now vitamins are organic substances and we group them into to fat soluble vitamins and then the water soluble vitamins the fat soluble vitamins are four main vitamins vitamin a vitamin d vitamin e and vitamin k is there now vitamin a we know vitamin a has been associated with the night blindness so it helps in the normal vision and it also provides resistance power to the body is there that it is present in the green leafy vegetables carrot mango and other yellow colored fruits they all contains the vitamin a vitamin d is about the bone formation and it also promote absorption of calcium phosphorus and this thing the rickets as you know as the vitamin d is the is there now vitamin d is not is present in our fruit and vegetables so we have not mentioned i have, we have only listed out particularly in reference to the the fruit and vegetables which is there vitamin e is essential for normal reproduction is there and vitamin k is present for uh, in uh, helps in blood clotting is there because it increases the prothrombin level in the blood is there water soluble vitamins are there vitamin b1 thiamin it causes the disease is known as beriberi is there it is helpful for carbohydrate meta metabolism is there vitamin b2 is riboflavin it regulates the function of insulin is there then niacin disease it causes the disease pellagra vitamin b6 it prevents dermatitis degeneration of nerves and it is particularly required for the growth of infants and functioning of hormones and this is present into the leafy vegetables that's why when the 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 doctors also recommend to the children you should give the leafy fruit leafy vegetables should be given their the winning foods are there then the uh, water soluble vitamins also include pantothenic acid it is the um, required for our hormone and the system then biotin is there it assist in activity of many enzyme systems folic acid absence causes anemia it is present in green leafy vegetables vitamin b12 it helps in maturation of red blood cells and functioning of bone marrow 
and nervous system so b12 is there vitamin c is particularly important for fruit and vegetable processing first thing is the fruits and vegetables are good source of uh, the vitamin c what does they help they help in formation of collagens and the osteoblasts then carbohydrate and cholesterol metabol metabolism then absorption of iron rapid healing of wounds and you must be aware if you recall your the learning at the high skin levels that disease called scurvy is prevented by the vitamin c is there this is present in amla orange lemon guava cabbage they are the good source when why we say it is anti protective because of the strong reduce, reducing property the any food if, if it has a strong reducing property it it helps the human system is there but as a food processor it is sensitive to temperature if you heat too high any fruit and vegetable processing you will be losing the vitamin c so we have to take care that it is minimum loss during food processing storage and cooking so this is the importance you have to take then we come to the the other minerals now minerals are inorganic in nature proteins carbohydrates and fats are organic minerals are inorganic they are also known as micronutrients the body contains 24 minerals and they are to be supplied by diet they are classified as macro and micro minerals phosphorus is required for the blood cells purposes similarly the there is importance for the sodium potassium chlorides also because it uh, for the stability to the body fluid so this is the is the iron and copper we know required for the hemoglobin purpose iodine is re required nowadays you must have seen the advertisement for the quieter purpose the iodine salt we should used is there so this is the importance of the minerals the other group which we add is then in the food constants which we cannot ignore is the food additives now what is the what are the food additives food additives are actually substances other than basic food stuff which is present in a food as a result of production processing storage or packaging now the term does not include the contaminants they are added for specific func functions to explain more things like preservative are example of food additives antioxidants are example of food acidulants neutralizers coloring agents flavoring agent sweeteners nutritional additives and miscellaneous nutritional additives if you add up these are the type of additives which are not present in the food stuff but we add up either to for processing purpose for increasing the storage shelf life or for giving some functional properties or health point properties so these are the things but there is a limit is there food additives we cannot add like anything we want so what we call them as a maximum permissible limits are there by the legal bodies acceptable we call them the term acceptable daily intake which should be stipulated which is required we will take one by one some of these things which are the first is the preservatives are there there are preservatives we say class 1 preservatives they are known as the natural preservatives like common salt sugar dextrose acetic acid honey vegetable oils there is no restriction to their addition right you can add up uh, these for the preservating is there but as per the legal requirements is there now the other two is class 2 preservatives they are the the chemical source like benzoic acid and salts sulfuric acids and salts nitrates sorbic acids lactic acids but mainly for the food purpose benzoate and sulfites are mostly used and nowadays even sorbic acids have been also allied for food and vegetable processing so these three class 2 preservatives could be given importance and have uh, detailing more like salt we know salt is the in pickling example when we prepare the pickle we we preserve the uh, use the salt is there how does they they preserve it they by reducing the water activity that the microorganisms will not be able to grow into there now the microorganisms the salt can they can some microorganism cannot salt 
uh, can tolerate one percent salt level they can tolerate but certain uh, very bad microorganisms can uh, can tolerate up to 13 percent so this is the uh, depending upon the the type of food the type of the organism which will be grown so we can use the salt similarly acetic acid is there and it there acetic acid is also it is more effective at lower ph and one to two percent acetic acid sufficient similarly sugar it reduces the water activity and it controls the growth of the microorganisms are there now when we select the preservatives how do we select this first thing is we have to see that what type in this type of food what type of microorganisms are going and what is the effectiveness level of that preservatives against that spoilage organism is there so we should also know about the the characteristics of the common spoilage organism associated with the product is there then physical chemical properties of both the preservative and the product is is there then the ph is also important then the safety and legal requirement of the preservative these are the the things are there the benzoic acid is mainly effective for yeast and mold can be controlled by using 0 0.05 to 1 percent is there they are more effective at low ph is there and it is used in squashes syrups fruit juices jams is there and we use the word gras that this is generally recognized as safe purpose and it is mostly sodium benzoate is used for the preservation 0.05 to 0.1 percent is used similarly sulfur dioxide and sulfides this is also permitted by pfa for food pulps for cordials for beverages and dehydrated is there and it also prevents enzymatic and non-enzymatic browning which we mentioned in the beginning that the browning can take place if the sugar is present and protein are present into the the food is there then sorbic acid and sorbates sorbates is also permitted and uh, these are can be used the nowadays the biologically derived antimicrobial nicin is one of the things which can be used for the purposes there i mentioned that in our uh, fruit and vegetables the fat and oil level is less but we must know what are the antioxidants in preserving fat and oil these are the the bha butylated hydroxy anisole and tolin these are the two antioxidants which are added into the as per the legal requirement can be added for the preserving the fat and oils is there how do they act they prevent the auto oxidation reaction into the this then we come to the acetylenes acetylenes contribute a, a functional properties like uh, mm, flavoring agents it can be buffering action preservation squeezing or viscosity modifiers is there they provide the uh, functional properties to the food that mostly are the ornic acids as far as the food are concerned like acetic acid ascorbic acid citric lactic acid malic and tartaric these are the type of there inorganic acid like phosphoric acid is normally used in the cola type beverages as there they are have been permitted but with certain restrictions so before going for using any of these things you we must check up with the legal requirements and what are the functional properties we have to take then the coloring agents are the there anthocyanins is there which gives the red blue and violet color these are the natural i mentioned then carotenoids are there which gives the yellow orange and red color to the is there and the, the sources for this is like apricot watermelon red guavas papaya yellow mage these are the sources for giving the is there then there is other chlorophyll is also there which gives the green color is, is there the chlorophyll are heat sensitive and during processing of fruit and vegetable the color is lost and the it changes into the brown color but the this the chlorophyll is better retained in the alkaline ph is there so when you are preparing any food formulation and if the color is alkaline at alkaline ph you will be able to maintain the chlorophyll color now synthetic colorants are also uh, prepared from the petrochemicals are there and mainly there are five classes azo parazol indigoid and these are the the things the common names they have been permitted and the, the the good advantage of this is their resistance to chemical reaction 
pH and heat compared. Like when you use the natural colorants, depending upon the pH and the heat, there could be some changes, but in synthetic colorants, there could not be, uh, they cannot be changed. Similarly, flavoring agents are also there. Uh, what is the flavor actually? It, it is a mix of taste and smell. And it is uh, in the mouth when you put the food, pain, tactile and temperature receptors are there. The flavoring is a very complex subject. Certain flavors components we have been able to identify like mm, uh, menthol in peppermint, benzylaldehyde in bitter almond, citrus in lime pimel, amyl acetate in ripe banana. We have been able to identify it but other things uh, is there. We have grouped them into natural flavorings, the natural identical flavoring substances and then the artificial flavoring substances is uh, there. Then next we come to the sweeteners. Sweeteners, uh, normally we are using the sucrose is used for the sweetness, for the functional properties like bulking agent and preservatives. Nowadays, sucrose alternatives are nutritive and non-nutritive are there. The sorbitol, xylitol and isomaltyl examples of the nutritive are there, right? And the non-nutritive sweeteners are the saccharin and saclamides are the examples of these things are there. We can also add up the miscellaneous additives like emulsifying, stabilizing, firming agents, particularly like calcium chlorides for the for giving the firmness to the canned foods, anti-caking agents and clarifying agents are used. Now to conclude the food constituents, we have discussed the chemistry and properties of the carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, water, enzymes, micronutritives and additives. We repeat that the chemistry part gives you the why component, why that is happening into the product and we must know the uh, the constituents details, their, their properties so that when you are preparing the food product, you can control the, the, the functional properties of the food. Thank you very much.